welcome to the Lynn Museum here at 590 Washington Street in Lynn. My name is Drew Russo. I have the honor of being the executive director of this organization, and I'm very pleased and just so delighted to see so many people uh, out for this wonderful celebration this evening. I'd like to turn it over to the guest of honor tonight, Mayor Costin, who has a few words. I'm not gonna stand because I may tumble. <laughs> but I, I did ask Drew if I could just introduce the first the speaker this evening, Mike Powers. Mike Powers' last day is today. He's the, he's the district manager for, 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 the, for Greater Boston. He has 440 post offices and branches. He has 12,370,000 employees. A man that the postmaster general calls on for any big problems he has. He didn't have to come down here tonight. He could have taken any one of those employees and said, get down to Lynn and do what I wanted, what, what, what you should do. But he's here tonight because he is a dear friend. And so I really appreciate Mike coming down. And I want to thank the, I want to thank Drew and the board here and all you people for taking time to listen to a 90 year old uh, talk about, talk about very fascinating time in his life. I think you'll all agree with me, a 90 year old legend <laughs> is the talk cause. Certainly a legend in the Postal Service, certainly a legend in this community. Tom did many, many great things for the Postal Service. Yes, this is my last day in the Postal Service. Whoa. I'm glad you weren't saying it was my last day ever. <laughs> <laughs> but I, too, t today is actually my last day. Tomorrow I start, you know, whatever happens after you, it's your last day of work. So it's all good. But I couldn't think of a better place to spend my last day, my last time than with Tom Costin, just a true friend. Somebody who has done remarkable things within our organization to assist others, always here for us, a wonderful, wonderful person. And the connection tonight is the JFK stamp. We just recently issued the JFK stamp to commemorate his 100th birthday. So when Tom and I were talking, he had this, and, and I said, we get just a stamp for this event, and it's so appropriate. And without further ado, I'd like, come on over here. That, mate, that, Mayor, you can come right here. And we'll get around here. Drew, if you want to jump in, come on in. Okay, we need some, how about a one, two, three? One, two, three, and there you go. So thank you very much, and um, in the back we have um, one of our employees who has to go to work tomorrow, like myself. <laughs> and she's been gracious enough, along with John Mr. Postmaster Lynn, to uh, sell the stamps, if you so choose, to use as a commemorative to, for tonight's event. So, great, great job, and what a great, great stamp, great tribute. Let me just thank you. Um, and again, you know, this is a fun part of my job. You know, I get to give gifts, too. <laughs> and to Tom, the friendship of the President Kennedy and, to, and to Mayor Costin, thank you for me from the Postal Service. Thank you very much. And finally, I'd like to make a presentation to Drew as well uh, for holding this event. It's just a, a spectacular, spectacular space, and hopefully, you can find an appropriate place for that. Okay. Thank you. Now, before we go on. Uh, we have our Mayor, Judith Flanagan Kennedy, with us this evening. She'd like to say a couple of words. Mayor? Actually, I can boil down what I have to say to probably three words. Um, two of the first three are thank you to Ted Grant and to Mayor Costin and to Drew Russo, because this is a, an absolutely fabulous concept, and it was a very inspired choice on all of your parts to bring everybody together tonight. And the third word that I'm going to use, I had previously purged from my vocabulary because, as Ted knows, I, I watch my vocabulary, um, and it's become overused. But tonight, in the 25 years that I have been in political circles in Lynn, tonight truly is a synergistic event. You have brought together, tied together, 
our Lynn legend, Mayor Costin, our president, John F. Kennedy, the 100th anniversary of his birth, the, the unveiling of the stamp in commemoration of that. This is a perfect storm of celebration. And I want to thank every single one of you for coming here. And once again, thanks again to the participants and to the organizers of the event. I can't wait to hear what you have to say, Mayor Costin. So very briefly, I just want to tell you a little bit about us. Obviously, the Lynn Museum and Historical Society turned 120 this year. It has been our privilege to curate the city's history, a remarkable history. A little bit uh, of President Kennedy's connection will be shared with us tonight. Uh, but we also, in 2014, merged with Lynn Arts, uh, which has been a cent center for art making in this city for over 25 years, uh, with two galleries, a black box theater, and studio space for rent uh, by local artists. Uh, so it is wonderful to be the director of this vibrant, dynamic organization. Uh, and I appreciate the thanks from the mayor and Mike Powers. But for me, without such an incredible staff and dedicated board of trustees, uh, many of whom are in the room tonight, a lot of this would not be possible. So please, a round of applause for them. Just a couple of quick announcements on events because we have a lot going on that we would love for you to come to. Uh, right now, our Heartstrings exhibit, Embracing Armenian Needle Lace, Embroidery, and Rugs, which tells an incredibly compelling story of the crafts that were made in the wake of the brutal genocide that drove the Armenian people from their ancestral homeland into the diaspora uh, is up in the rotating gallery on the second floor uh, for the next couple of weeks. And we'll have a closing reception for that exhibit uh, on June 10th where some of the collectors that donated those works to us for this exhibit uh, will be here to talk about uh, their stories and the stories of their ancestors uh, who wove these wonderful, wonderful tapestries. <coughs> On June 14th, our Museum Enrichment Series for Adults continues with Antonio Morales, Citizen Archaeology, Bottle Collection of the Morales Family. The Moraleses are a Westland family. Mr. Morales and his family members, his son, his grandson, have been collecting apothecary bottles uh, from the early late 19th and early 20th century for over 25 years, and they've done a masterful job of of sort of bringing a collection together that they now want to share uh, with their neighbors here in Lynn. So we're very excited about that. Uh, this July, we're thrilled to welcome acclaimed artist and West Lynn native, or West Lynn resident, I believe he's a Saugus native, Jeff Fioravanti's newest show, The Vision Place of Souls, uh, which looks at his interpretations of the Eastern theater of the American Civil War. Uh, Jeff is a highly regarded national artist in our midst. He's with us tonight. Jeff, can you raise your hand? Uh, so hopefully you will join us for that show. Jeff's in the back. Thank you for being with us. It will open July 5th through December 22nd uh, with an opening reception on July 9th. 19th, uh, and Jeff will be the speaker at our Mesa program on July 12th. Uh, at Lynn Arts, we have two exciting exhibits opening. Nature Exhibition is opening on June 17th uh, from 3 to 6 p.m. It's actually available for viewing now and will be open through July 25th. Uh, we also have at the same time a walk through Lynn, uh, which is a wonderful uh, series of works by artist Annette Sykes, uh, who is the chair of our curatorial committee uh, in the small gallery over at Lynn Arts. Uh, and also happening at Lynn Arts right now, our partners at Arts After Hours are staging Next to Normal, which opens tonight through June 17th, uh, which is a, a very compelling look at the effects of mental illness uh, on on our families, on our communities. Uh, they've worked with professionals at the Lynn Community Health Center and have done an amazing job. So lots going on and we hope that you will join us. Uh, events like this are only possible through the support of community members like you. Tonight we are particularly grateful to our event sponsors, uh, Wood and Associates Insurance Agency, Rick Wood. And I'm gonna give Rick the floor for just a moment because I know he has a presentation for his good friend, Tom Costin. Uh, so Rick. Well, I guess great minds think alike because uh, as a somewhat amateur stamp collector, I uh, was excited when this stamp came out, and then I saw the uh, <clears throat> got the invitation for this event, and I thought I'd put it together for Tom, as just as a thank you for all Tom's done for our community. We're also grateful to our other event sponsors this evening: uh, uh, A. James Lynch Insurance Company, uh, Community Credit Union. Uh, the Ed and Mildred, Mildred Cahill family, and I believe Ed Cahill is with us tonight or will be joining us soon. Uh, and also uh, our beloved friend and trustee, Steve Rima at McDonald's, who uh, 
made admission possible for many people tonight uh, through his generous sponsorship, so thanks to them as well. Uh, before I turn it over to Ted, just two quick things. If you like what you see and hear tonight, I hope that you'll consider supporting us. Uh, you can become a member of the museum and see Sue and Jack at the front uh, and on how to join the Lynn Museum. We also gave you information about a fun summer party over in Nahant on June 28th that will support the institution. Uh, so if you'd like to party, we're, we're a fun crowd, so I, we hope that you'll join us. And you can also buy tickets online or with Sue and Jack tonight. Uh, so that's a basic rundown. i sorry it took a couple minutes, but there's a lot going on here that we're proud of and we want all of you, particularly those of you that are here for the first time, to be a part of that. Uh, our MC tonight is somebody that I've known uh, and respected for a very, very long time. Ted Grant is principal owner and publisher of The Daily Item, principal of Grant Communications Consulting Group, and president of the Lynn Business Partnership and of the Aganis Foundation. In 2014, Grant formed Essex Media Group to purchase and publish The Item and itemlive.com. It has added two weekly newspapers, the Lynn and Peabody Weekly News, three magazines, uh, and a Spanish-language newspaper. Uh, he is the chair of the Lynn Business Partnership, the chair of the Aganis <clears throat> Foundation, uh, and he will be serving as our master of ceremonies tonight. So, Ted, I turn it over to you. Mike Powers used the word legend, and Mayor Kennedy followed with it. So how do you introduce a legend? Uh, Thomas Patrick Coston, Jr., was mayor of Lynn, he loved the Patrick part, did you notice that? <laughs> was mayor of Lynn from 1955 to 1961. He was postmaster from 1961 to 1992. He is Greater Lynn's most respected and to some of us most beloved senior statesman. He has also rubbed elbows with some pretty interesting people. We'll hear about one of them tonight. There's not much more you can add to an introduction to a legend, so I'll throw in a personal note. One of the great privileges of my life, for the past 25 years, I have called Tom a friend and a mentor. Shall we? Yes. <laughs> I'm ready to go. <laughs> and Mike, he means that just for tonight, not he's ready to go. Tell us about the first time you met John F. Kennedy. Well, before I tell you about that, I got to tell Oh, you already? He's off script. <laughs> I can't go. Drew, I, I told you this was going to be a nightmare. I, I, have, to tell you, I have to tell you something else. I, I, pulled, I pulled the Jack Kennedy stunt. I, I went out in the sun last week for a couple, a couple of days, and, and I, I, I told my wife, I'm going to do exactly what Jack Kennedy always did. And he, he told me, he said, before a big event, make sure you get a little tan. And the, and the night of the event, make sure you wear a blue shirt. So I'm wearing a blue shirt. So I said to my wife, I get all dressed up, and I said to my wife, do you think I look a little younger? She said, it's fantastic. I can't believe it. You do. I said, great. I said, how old do I look? She said, not old over a day over 89. <laughs> so I don't know how long I can last with this. When did I see meet? Who did I meet? I'm sorry. I had to tell that story. <laughs> well, this, this is your you world. We're just living in it. <laughs> what do you want to know? That guy, Kennedy. Oh, Kennedy. All right. Um, Tell us about the first time you met him, Tom. Well, I got out of the Marine. I went to the, into the Marine Corps when I was 17. I, I, I went in because my father in 1917 uh, joined the Marines, and I heard the story. We lived next to my grandmother all the time that she had to go up and sign his papers. So the day after I graduated, I went to the Marine Corps in Boston, and Eddie Kale was the Marine sergeant. And so Eddie Kale said, you're too young, kid. Get your father or your grandmother or somebody to come in and sign for you. So I went home and saw my grandmother first. And I said, Nana, if my father won't sign my papers, will you go with me? So I went home right next door. And I said, Dad, I tried to join the Marines. He said, you're not going to join anything. I said, that's OK. Nana's taking me in tomorrow. <laughs> so he said, you son, son of a nice kid. He said, I'm gonna, I'll take you in. So he took me in. 
And so I was in the Marine Corps for two years, and uh, it was a, a family, not only my family to, uh, 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 tradition, but it became a family tradition of, uh, of, my, of my late wife, this family, and so forth. And uh, so anyway, uh, uh, I went, when I got out, it, I was uh, 20 years of age, and it was too late in August to get to BC. So I went to Northeastern Nights, and uh, one night coming, uh, I got the bus in Haymarket Square. They were having a rally across the street. And I went across the street, and it was a rally of candidates running for Congress in that uh, district, Cambridge and in Boston and East Boston. And Jack Kennedy was just coming off the stage. I shook his hand and said, best of luck. And he said, thanks. And the next day, I wrote him a little note, best of luck again. And so anyway, he got elected. And the next, uh, and so what, but a lot of, what I was doing during the daytime, I was walking the streets of Ward 7. I was knocking on doors to become the Ward 7 counselor. Now, I wasn't even 21. I was 20. No one asked me my age, but I told them I was a Marine, former Marine. And I wanted to help. I wanted to do something. People weren't doing anything. And I got elected. And uh, uh, when I got elected, uh, I got a note from Jack Kennedy. Congratulations. And the, there was a picture in the paper uh, of me uh, election night. Uh, uh, and the, uh, the, uh, the, right, well, it was the day after the election, the Lynn item had it. And I got a, two weeks later, I got a call from, uh, from uh, uh, Joseph Kennedy, uh, the ambassador. And he said, uh, I, uh, Mr. Carson, I hope you don't mind if I call you Tom. I said, of course not, ambassador. He said, I'd like to, I'd like to meet with you sometime. Is there any way that you might be able to come into Boston and meet with me? I said, Mr. Bassett, I am so busy. I, I, I just got, <laughs> I told him that I just got elected and I'm getting calls from my constituents already and, and I have to do homework. He said, I know how busy you can get. He said, I'm awful sorry, but could you just, I said, all right. So we set up a couple of dates and I went in to see him in the Ritz. And when I went into his, got to his apartment, when I rang the bell, a, a, a band servant opened the door and I looked through, and he was in the bedroom on the telephone. And so he waved me in. And I'm not going to tell you the name of the paper or the person he was talking to, but he was going up one side of the, and down the other of the individual on the phone. And the reason was that in the paper, they had put an article, one of the people had put an article that maybe Jack Kennedy, instead of being a hero, should be paying back the government of the United States for losing the a big torpedo boat, and the two lives of the people with them. And, 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 and the ambassador said, listen, he said, if I see another story like this in here, I'm buying that goddamn paper, and you'll be out of a job walking the streets. <laughs> then, he, then he put down the phone, and different person all together. Tom, thank you for so nice. You're nice of you to drop in the scene. And, and people, have, people have said to me, Weren't you intimidated? Well, you know, I wasn't intimidated. And the reason why I wasn't intimidated is because he was calling me, looking for me to do something for him. I wasn't calling him to ask him for a favor. And the favor that he wanted was this. He said, Tom, what I want to do, I want to build a new organization around my son. I want to get young people, people who have ambition like you, who at age 21 can be elected. And he said, what I want my son to do is to work with you. I want him to, to any legislation going through the Congress that has to do with veterans, has to do with schooling, has to do with uh, anything to do with the cities, jobs. I want him to send you the legislation and let you take a look at it and come back with some recommendations. And so I'd be very happy to do that. And then he said, what is it your people want? I said, well, if going around, this is what they want. The younger people want to be able to get a schooling, get the schooling. After the schooling, they want jobs. And for jobs, they want to get married and have homes and children and be happy. And the older ones, they want to get married. If they're not married, they want homes and they want jobs. And that's what you got to work on. 
So it happened. I started getting calls from Jack. I get a lot of correspondence from him, and I have it all. I don't want to tell the postal people, but there's one great big room down in the post office in the basement that they want me to clean out. I don't know how many years I've been retired, but every year they say, Tom, do you think you might be able to clean out that room with all these, uh, these things from Washington? And so one day I'm going to do it. <laughs> but, 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 but anyway, that was my, that was my first, first meeting. And then uh, the way I was able to help, help Jack, our uh, next door neighbor on Pennybrook Road uh, was a veteran, and he became the state president of the AMBET Association, and he asked me, if there's a possibility of getting Jack Kennedy as a speaker. So I got Jack Kennedy as a speaker, and I introduced him at the New Ocean House. And so that's how things went on with him. I would call him, or he would call me. Is that enough? <laughs> I don't know, I dozed off for a couple of minutes. <laughs> I do want to clarify one thing. He wasn't yelling at the owner of the item. <laughs> That was your introduction to yeah. Joe Kennedy. Joe, tell yeah. us about one particular call you got from Congressman Kennedy. Oh, oh, okay. Uh, well, this was this was. Uh, uh, what call was that? Oh, oh no, the the picture up there. I had I had three meetings with the with, with the the ambassador, and after my last meeting with him, uh, he gave me a, a, this this photo. Of, of his family it was taken in 1937 in a beautiful frame. And uh, the frame doesn't show there, but, but, but this is something that uh, he said, I, I want you to have. Uh, I, got a call, I got a call in 1951, in late 1951, from Jack. He said, I'd like to see you at my apartment up on the Bowden Street. So, so, so I dropped in Bowden Street, and, and when I got, uh, get inside, uh, he had a, a, a Frank Morrissey was his driver, and uh, so Frank Morrissey said, "You got to come into the bathroom because the congressman is in the tub; his back is bothering." And I sat on the hopper talking to the congressman, <laughs> and, and what the congressman wanted, he said, "Tom, he said, do you think there's any possibility that you and your wife could have a have a, 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 a party for me? Because I, I want to get outside my district because I'm, I'm not sure whether I'm going to run for the Senate." Well, I'm going to run for governor, and I'm waiting for Deva, the governor, to make up his mind. But if he doesn't make up his mind, I'm going to jump in uh, and run against, uh, run against Lodge. And so anyway, uh, we set up the date, and it was going to be the, in the 1st of February. Uh, and, and, and the morning of the affair, I get a call from Frank Morrissey. Tom, the, the, the congressman has had a touch of malaria, and what we got to do, we got to get him in the house get him in a nice soft chair, and then we got to get him right out. I said, OK, that'll be fine. The congressman came down, sat on the soft chair, and at quarter past 12 the next morning in our kitchen, <laughs> he was drinking a second cup of coffee. And I was saying to myself, how the hell can I get him out? I got to go to work tomorrow. <laughs> Is that the story you want? <laughs> Not bad. I have the evidence for everything I say. <laughs> so Kennedy was elected to the Senate in 1952, and you were elected mayor of Lynn in 1955. Yeah. As senator, he made several trips to your office in City yeah. Hall. Yeah. Tell us about one memorable uh, one. All right, but before I tell you that, I've got to clear something up. <laughs> Just forget the script, right? <laughs> no, what I, no, what I, I have to, to clear up is this. Uh, my wife, Rosemary uh, Cole, came from a Republican family. And her father was Joe Cole, uh, who was, uh, had, had so many jobs in the city because he was so well-liked and did everything, everything so well. So I had two mentors. I had my father and I had Joe Cole. And, and, and the problem was that Al Cole, uh, his brother, was mayor of the city, had been mayor of the city, gone into the war, and because he was uh, friendly with, uh, friendly with the, the, the senator, he was put on, he was put on MacArthur's staff out in the Philippines. And, and so when he came home, he wanted to run for mayor again. And, and so 
uh, he was very, very close to, to, uh, to, to Lodge. And so what I did, uh, between my meeting and, and what I was going to do, I sat down with my father-in-law, and I told him, uh, Kennedy is going to run against Lodge, and he wants me to help him. And, and my father-in-law said, Tom, he said, what I want you to do, you do what you think is going to be best for you. And he said, I think because your family is Democratic, stay with the Democratic Party. And, that, and, and that's what I did. But I didn't do it until I talked to him because I had so much respect for him. Jack Kennedy would call me when he was going to go north. He was going to go to Salem or some other place in, in, in the county. And he'd give me a call and say, Tom, I'm coming in. Can I drop in and see you? And then before he'd, he'd hang up, he said, uh, I'd like to get uh, a chicken salad sandwich and a frap from that Hennessy's across from City Hall. And of course, I had to pay for the, for the sandwich and the frap. So we always go to frap and so forth. And then sometimes he'd come in and he'd shave if he's going to be out and, and be talking. And so, and so the next day after one of these visits, uh, I found his tie clip. And so the next morning, I get a call from him. He said, Tom, he said, did I leave my tie clip? I said, yeah. I said, I have it. He said, send it to me. I said, no, I'm not sending it to you. He said, why? I said, look, find these, keep these, lose these, whip these. <laughs> He said, what did you say? I said, listen closely. I found it. You lost it. I keep it. <laughs> he said, what do you want to keep that thing for? I said, look at Jack. Sometime in the near future, you're going to be president of the United States. He said, you're nutty. And he hang up the phone. <laughs> okay. Did you keep it? <laughs> I'm not afraid. <laughs> He's only a president. Tom, you were a delegate to the 1956 Democratic National Convention in Chicago. Yeah. Tell us a little about that. Okay. All right. That was the, my first convention. Uh, I was a delegate because being mayor of the city, I didn't have to run for the, for the, for the position, but I, I became a delegate. And so I had my, my assistant uh, 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 at City Hall was Bob Weber, who was a, a lawyer. And uh, he, uh, uh, Bob and I went out to the convention. And uh, we met, it, it started that Jack thought there's a possibility he might be able to do something. Uh, and the only problem was that the Democratic State Committee did not want Kennedy for anything. They were upset when Jack Kennedy got elected because they felt that the father had bought the position for him. And they wouldn't lift, they wouldn't lift a finger. And one of the members of the, of the delegation was James Michael Curley. And, and, and what, what, what would happen, we would have, um, we would have a, 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 a morning meal, and uh, for each state would, have, would be, the one, uh, be the sponsor, and then the leading, the leading politician would be the speaker. And so when it came to Massachusetts' turn, uh, uh, Ted Kennedy was the speaker. Now, Curley always had this fellow walk in front of him. We always called him Up Up McGinty, because what he'd say is, Up Up, here comes the governor, Up Up, here comes. and people wouldn't know. And what he did, he waited until Kennedy, who was right in the middle of his speech, opened the door and walked right down the center aisle while Kennedy is speaking. And Up Up McGinty is going, Up Up, here comes, here comes the governor, speak to the governor, say hi to the governor. And Jack Kennedy just stopped. And he was sat, went down and sat right in front of Jack Kennedy while he was speaking. We usually met in the morning. But after that meeting, or after that event, we met about two hours later. And Jack Kennedy said, I'm taking over that goddamn state committee when we go home. <laughs> and he said, the way I'm going to do it, he said, I'm going to go to every city in town and talk to the city com committee man and woman, and we're going to rip up that old party and make it a new party. And that's exactly what he did. Now, the other thing we did out there uh, is uh, uh, the hotel where we were staying was right across the street from a big 
a, a, a big department store. And they were having a sale for, clear, for, for plain ties, a dollar of plain ties. And there was all, they were also advertising that on the second floor, the machine, the people with the, the sewing machines were having demonstrations. So I went in and got the man in here and said, I want 200 plain ties. He said, what? I said, I want, he said, well, for colors. I said, any color as long as they're plain. So we got 200 plain ties. I said, I'm only going to buy them if you can take the 200 and in a day's time have the sewing machine people sew in Kennedy VP. He said, yeah, we can do it. We have to come back tomorrow. So we did. And when they came back, I gave them to the people in our committee. Jack Kennedy hadn't seen them. We passed them out to people in other delegations who wanted to be for Kennedy. When Kennedy saw the ties, he wondered what happened. I, and so they all looked at me. I said, well, I bought the ties. And he said, what'd you do with them? I said, I passed them out. He said, pass them out? Why didn't you sell them? <laughs> Thank you, Jack. <laughs> uh, but you know, it's a good thing that he didn't get that nomination, because Stevenson wasn't going to win. And if Kennedy had been on the ticket, they would have blamed it because Kennedy was a Catholic. So it was a good thing that he didn't do it. But what I did do, when Jack Kennedy came back, he went to every city and town. He came to Lynn, and I had George O'Shea, who was a knucklehead, to, I hope, I hope, Tom is gone. No, not Tom. That's Thomas J. I, I mean, he doesn't. No, that's not McGee. All right. So anyway, no. What? 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 What happened? George O'Shea was head of the sanitary department, and, and and being mayor, I was chairman of the sanitary, uh, the chairman of the Ways and Drainage Commission, and it was the. The department heads who uh, had the, the, the water department, sewer department, and street department were on that, and then two members of the uh, 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 councils at large. And we had the say over uh, all, of, all the things. And, and uh, uh, when, I, when I was on that, when I was on that, at that Ways and Drainage Commission as the, what, as the uh, uh, counselor, Albert Wally was hated, hated the George O'Shea and always trying to get rid of him. But I always stood up for him and fought for him. So I told Jack Kennedy, I said, no problem. We'll have George O'Shea and we'll And the other person, the woman person, well, the woman who was a Democratic committee woman, her name was Mary Kennedy. No relation to Jack, but Mary Kennedy. So I had them in my office, and we had, we had, the, we had Jack down. And so he was talking to them about having a new, a, a new whole new committee. And he wanted to bring in, a, bring in a, a new manager of the, of the committee and so forth. And Mary Kennedy right away said, yes, I'm with you all the way. And then, uh, what's his name? Um, um, the other fellow. <laughs> he said, no. He said, I can't. He said, I'm very, very close. I'm very, very close to John McCormick. And so I'm going to stay with, with the committee we have right now. And, and, and I said, you, you know, uh, George, don't you think with all the things I've helped you with, don't you think it'd be nice if you kind of please me? Can't do it. Can't do it. I've been with that group all of my life. I'm going to stay with them. Well, he stayed with them, but Kennedy got the, the votes he needed, and that whole committee was voted out, and they brought in a whole new committee with a whole new chairman of the, of the Democratic Committee, and that ch changed the whole atmosphere for the Democratic Party in Massachusetts. Is that the story you want? <laughs> okay. All right, that, but that picture there was taken out, out in Chicago. Uh, I think that was before he found out I gave away the ties. <laughs> Tell us about Senator Kennedy's re-election campaign in 1956. Oh, 1956. He's re-elected in 56. Is that what he ran? Senate. His yeah. Senate re-election. Huh? Yeah, tell us. Oh, yeah. Do you remember the? We, I'm sorry. We had, we had, uh, we, right. had uh, we had, uh, three, three times in Lynn. Uh, one time we had it at the at the Harrington School, and uh, we had we had no, that's not the Harrington School. No, that's that's 58. Okay, that. Uh, well, you want this one first? Okay, 
He gets that about 50 years, okay? <laughs> this, picture, this picture here uh, was taken uh, <coughs> in 1958. That's what the science says in 1958. <laughs> when he was running for re-election, and what he did, uh, his, son, his brother Ted uh, just came back from the army, and uh, he named Ted as his campaign chairman. And then, and, and Jack called me and said, Tommy said, will you be the chairman for registration for the Democratic Party? And I said, sure, I'd be very happy to. So that picture was taken uh, the day that he made the announcement that Ted was going to be his campaign chairman, and Tom Carson, the mayor of Lynn, was going to be the uh, person to run the registration drive. And then after that picture was taken, he said to me, he said, what you have to do, Tom? He said, Governor, Governor Deva wants to meet with you, and also John McCormick. And I said, sure, I'll go, I'll go meet with him. And the reason they wanted to meet with me, when I met with the governor, he said, Mayor, he said, I hope you realize that Jack Kennedy isn't the only Democrat on that ticket. I said, no, I know governor, but he's one, he's one of them. And I said, you're another one. And I said, I'm going to be there for all the Democrats. He said, well, as long as you do that, he said, I'm going to go along with you. So I, well, I'll take care of you. And so then I had to go and see John McCormick. Now, John McCormick was very diplomatic. John McCormick said, Tommy said, you know, this is the old, old party we have, and a lot of people, and we've got to be sure that we don't get the old timers mixed up uh, and, and, and fed them fade away or go on that other party. I said, I know that, Mr. Speaker, and I'm going to be sure it doesn't happen. He said, you're going to be sure you're going to be with all the candidates. I, they're going to be with all the candidates. Now, what we did, we broke, we broke uh, my small group and Lynn up into, uh, into two, two man teams that we sent out to, to train other people about what you look for in a Democrat. And, uh, but the last thing I told them was this. I said, when you're talking with people, make sure you mention the fact that if we get a big enough registration here in Massachusetts, that Jack Kennedy be, could be the next president. But that's going to be the last thing I want you to say. In uh, two years ago, a book came out, The Five Seasons, talked about five presidents. And in the book on page 113, it mentioned Massachusetts and Jack Kennedy. At that year, the Democratic registration was the highest at, at any time ever and, was lo and, and bigger than any other state in the country. And it was all because we used that last phrase, if we get big enough, we could have a president. And I think that did it. Mm -hmm. Tom, in 1960, yeah. the Democratic National Convention was in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little about it. All right. In, in 19, well, in 1958, uh, <laughs> the, the, the reason, hold it. No, no. no I, in 19, see that? See that type clip? That was in 1960. And see the Kennedy 60 on it? But in 1958, the type clip that he gave out in 58 was just Kennedy with no date on it. So he had two, two, two tie clasps. And if anybody read the paper when, 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 the, when the vice president was in Lynn, I gave him the first tie, tie class. I, I, I told him, uh, I want you to know, Mr. Vice President, that this tie class came from the president, I mean, from the president to me, and it's going to you. And he took it. He didn't want to take it, but he took it. And he said, I'm going to invite you and your wife to the White House, which he never did. <laughs> and I am remembering it. I, I, I'm going to remember that. I'm not going to know of it. I'll remember that one. Okay. Uh, so, so in 1960, uh, it was out, out in Los Angeles. And, and what we, what we had special assignments. And my, one of my assignments was I had to uh, kind of babysit uh, Senator uh, Mike, Mike Monroney from, uh, from Oklahoma. Mike Monroney had declared for Jack Kennedy, and, 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 and since uh, the, the, the uh, senator from uh, Johnson was running against, him, uh, against Jack, uh, uh, 
we, Jack was always afraid that Monroney might switch over. So my job was to kind of babysit him every day. And so Mike got a little tired of it. And he said, Tom, he said, look, at, stop trailing me like you are. He said, I'm going to do what I say. I'm going to give you my son, young Mike, and he has my telephone number. And if you need me, so I got very <coughs> friendly with, with young Mike. And I'll tell, about, tell you about young Mike a little later on. But uh, anyway, he stayed, with, he stayed with Jack Kennedy, and, and, and then I was given other assignments. On the day of the voting, on the day of the voting, we were seated, the mass Demo uh, uh, committee was seated right where you see the, where the writing is. We were right down there. Now, and, and the Massachusetts sign was right there, right in front of the microphone. And, and while we were waiting for the, the meeting to start, Judge Jack DeBoer was walking the floor. <laughs> Now, I had my wife with me, and she was sitting next to me, and thank God she was there, I'll tell you, because as Jazab Gabor was walking through, she sat on my lap and gave me a kiss. I should have ran off with her. Just a joke, that's a joke. I have to talk to my wife about this tonight. <laughs> But, but, uh, 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 but anyway, that's what we did. We, we, we would have meetings, we'd have maybe three or four meetings a day, and we'd, we'd, get, we'd, get, different, we'd get different assignments. But, but it, worked out, it worked out fine. Jack Kennedy, Jack Kennedy made it. And uh, another question? Tell us about the inauguration. Oh, well, OK. But, but before the inauguration, uh, I'm, in the, uh, I'm, in the, uh, I'm in the mayor's office. And I get a call from Jack Kennedy. And he says to me, he says, Tom, he said, I want you to come to the White House with me. I said, to do what, Jack? He said, I, I, we don't know yet, but he said, what I'm going to do is get the people that were around me, because I want people I can trust. I want them in certain positions. I want you to come with me. I said, well, thank you so much. So when I put the phone down, I called my wife, Rosemary, and I said, pack the bags. She said, for well, what? I said, Jack Kennedy just called me and invited me and you to go to Washington. There was a pregnant pause. And she said, if you think I'm taking five small youngsters to Washington while you spend 24 hours at the White House, you're crazy. So I said, OK. Uh, she said, why don't you go by yourself? <laughs> Do you ever see a dead man walking? <laughs> so I called him back. I called Jack back. And he said, wife problems? I, I said, yeah. So it, 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 there was a story in the paper two weeks before that the postmaster, Lynn, uh, Tommy Wilkerson, was going to retire. I said, he said, what do you want? I said, make me postmaster, Lynn. He said, postmaster, Lynn? <laughs> Are you crazy? He said, take me postmaster. He said, I'll think about it. So we go to the inaugural down in Washington. And the night of the inaugural ball and, and, re and reception was snowing like hell. We had about a foot of snow, and no one had galoshes. <laughs> no one had raincoats or heavy, well, we had heavy coats or whatever. But we got soaked and going to the, going to the, to the it, it was the reception first, and then, then it was the dinner. As I'm walking through the line, uh, I come to Jack Kennedy, and he says to me, Tom, you're going to be postmaster. Oh, I said, great. I said, but look at Dan Day, who from Lynn, uh, also wanted to be postmaster. I said, Dan Day is a couple of down the line. He said, he's going to get some other job. So I kiss, I kiss Jackie next to, next to, uh, next to uh, the president. And then I go on to Bobby, and I'm shaking Bobby's hand, and I hear Jack, Tom, Tom. I look around, he said, Dan Day's going to be your boss. <laughs> and, and Dan Day was. Dan Day became the deputy director of the, post, of the Boston Postal Region. And uh, I'd almost a job like, like Mike had here, OK? And, uh, and uh, so uh, that was fine with me. So uh, but uh, it, was, uh, it was a great experience, great experience. So without Josh Agabor. You visited the newly elected president in Washington. Yeah. 
Tell us about it. Uh, well, it was in May. It was in May, and it was a national mayor's, mayor's convention. And what I did, I, I made arrangements to take all of all the members of the city council with me. And I, and, and I called the White House, and I got a meeting uh, to have uh, the president meet myself and, uh, and all the members of the city council. And uh, the, day that, the day that we went, uh, oh, what, what are you, how am I really back up? <laughs> no, 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 no I, I really have to, I have to back up here because you won't, you won't understand why, why, why Jack wanted me to do certain things. When I, when I, was, when I was mayor, my, my, when my first, first month I was mayor, uh, I was also chairman of the welfare department. And uh, when I had the meeting with the welfare department, I, we, had, we had the poor farm in Lynn. And, and uh, uh, what we did, there was a lot of fields behind the poor farm. And, and people who lost their homes and so forth and, and families, they would take the families and let them live there and feed them. But they would have to work on the farm during the good weather. And, and so uh, I noticed, I, I, for the first meeting I went to, I noticed that the, that the, the client uh, uh, went up high on a Friday night, and the Monday morning, it'll fall off. So I said to, I said to uh, Joe Murphy, who was ahead of it, I said, Joe, what causes this big influx and then the, out, the output? It was very, very, very easy, he said. These are all the drunks. The police pick up all the drunks on Friday night, throw them up there, we give them, we give them three days of, of good food, and they give them a pair of pants and send them away, and then a, month, a week later they're back there again. I said, "Don't you, don't you give them any 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 medical treatment?" He said, "No, we can't afford that." So, so uh, when I when I heard that, uh, what I did, I, I put together a team. I got the the uh, uh, the owner and and uh, executive director of the uh, Saugus General Hospital. And uh, I got uh, a doctor in Lynn, uh, I got a bank in Malden, and I got my brother Dick, who had the second highest land in Lynn, uh, uh, called Mount Pleasant. Uh, and we put together and built the first brand new hospital devoted for alcoholism and drug abuse. Every other alcoholic hospital for treatment in Massachusetts was a, in a rehab building. So we did this, and I told Jack Kendi about this. And, and he, was, he really thought, thought about that. And, and I said, the other thing that I'm going to do, Jack, when, he, when we talked about it, Jack, is that I made it mandatory that no one who was drunk as an employee in the city could be fired unless we gave them an opportunity to get help. And I told him that. So, so when, when, when I went, took, the, took the councils down to, uh, when that wasn't that important, I told him that? It was. No, no, the, the reason I tell you it was important because it made the difference in what I did. Uh, because uh, when we, uh, we went down, uh, we were taken to the, uh, went to the White House, we were taken to the, the room where the cabinet would meet. And, and they had people come in and talk about the pictures and talk about everything that happened at the White House, and they were going to take him around and so forth. And while they were doing that, Kenny O'Donnell came in and said, Tom, the president wants to see you in the Oval Office. So I went to the Oval Office, sat down beside the, the president's uh, desk, and the first thing I said to him was, Jack, I, I have something to give you. And I took off the tie clip and gave it to Jack Kennedy and said, this is the one you lost. He said, thank God. He took it and put it on. <laughs> put it on. And so anyway, he said, Tom, when are you going to become postmaster? I said, look, I'm trying to save the city a little money. If I should retire from the mayor's office right now and go to Washington and become a postmaster, it means the city would have to have a special election, and that would cost money. Plus the fact that the fall is back in the city council, voting against all the things they want to do in the city, and I don't want him to become mayor. <laughs> and so it me, Henry Wall wants to run for mayor, the president, and by me waiting till July 1st, so he's my wife's birthday. 
June 30th. I said, that's a great day. So uh, I, I was appointed, and, and Dan Day and, 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 uh, and the people from, from Boston came down and swore me in. And uh, then, then, uh, then what uh, uh, swore me in, and um, I, became, I became the postmaster. And so uh, when, 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 I, when I was talking with, uh, with, uh, with Jack, uh, well, while I was talking with him, uh, Kenny O'Donnell came in and said, Mr. President, you have to go out and get the keys to your new limousine. So he said, come on, Tom, come with me. He said, we'll take some pictures. And now, Jack was on crutches because he had been in Canada the week before, hurt his back, planting a tree. And so he was on crutches walking out. I went out with him and, my, and had my picture taken with, the, with, the, uh, with this limousine. This is the, in the first one with a clear plastic bulletproof top. And so after we get back into the, into the Oval Office, I said, uh, uh, oh, no, he said, Tom, he said, uh, I have a present for you. He took the tie clap, handed it back to me, and he said, the reason you're getting it back is this. The time that I called you and you gave me that little, little Rick and me rhyming thing you gave me, he said, the last thing you said to me really hit me. You said that I'd be president of the United States, and you had such conviction. No one else that I had talked to in those days even thought I could be president, but you did. And he said, this president is now giving you a present from me in the Oval Office to one of my best friends. I have worn this tie ever since until tonight. <laughs> one of the things I've got to tell you is the most important thing was before I left, and oh, he didn't, he, uh, what I forgot to tell you, the things he was going to have me do. And this is what he told me. He said, Tom, he said, there are three, three things that I'm going to do. He said, two really are going to have a, a, an impact on you. He said, uh, what I'm going to do is I can't get my civil rights bill through the Congress. So he said, what I'm going to do, I'm going to issue an executive order that in all federal buildings in the country, especially down the Mason-Dixon area, you cannot have separate water fountains colored in white. You cannot have separate eating facilities colored in white. And you cannot have separate toilet facilities colored in white. And he said, what I'm going to do, he said, when you become postmaster, I want you to head up a team to get down in the areas that you're having, they're having problems and he said, that's going to be the first thing. Second thing is, my second executive order is what we're, what we're going to do. I don't like the idea that Congress is setting all the, 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 the rules for work for the workplace and, and also for money, for, for, the, for the salary for the workers. What I'm going to do is issue an executive order having it mandatory that the, the managers in the, in the various areas where the people work have to sit down with the employee unions and work out their work schedules and, 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 and everything that they want to do and also salaries. So he said, I'm going to put you on the board with the Postmaster General on the management side because I like what you did about, the, about alcoholism. I want the same thing to happen in the federal service, that no federal employee can be fired unless they're given an opportunity. And so that was the first thing. And then he said, the second thing I want to have you do, I'm going to have you be one of the instructors out at the Norman, uh, Oklahoma, at the University of Oklahoma. I want you to be one of the instructors. I said, I'm not even a postmaster yet. No, he said, but if they, all I want them to know is that you have to listen to people and you have to be, have to be open-minded. And I said, I think you can get that message through. So I said, thank you. Then what he said is, I'm going to give you my card. And he wrote his private number on it. And he said, any time 
that you need me at any of these assignments, I want you to call me. So I said, okay, and I put the card in my pocket. Tom, talk about the meeting, about the post offices and oh, yeah. uh, anti-discrimination. All right, okay. That's when I become postmaster, right? Okay. Um, he, he, he made, uh, I told you about young Mike, Mike Monroney, the fellow. Uh, the postmaster general that, that was appointed by, by, by Kennedy, was, his name was J. Edward Day. He was the law partner to, uh, to uh, uh, Adlai Stevenson. And, and his administrative assistant, which was the second highest job there, became Mike Monroney, Jr., whose father was the uh, chairman of the Post Office Civil Service Committee in the Senate. And so when it came time for me to be na named the postmaster, uh, and the, the way the names we had to go in, it had to be the highest ranking elected official, Democratic official in the area. And, and, and my congressman, Tom Lane, would not send my name in. He wanted to have the man in Lynn, who was the administrative assistant, become the postmaster. Now, that man just happened to be a cousin to my mother-in-law. But <laughs> true. Uh, yeah. And, 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 uh, so, but anyway, uh, anyway, what uh, uh, the president did was to call Tom Lane and said, don't send me any name for postmaster Lynn. I've already taken care of it. I've already sent Tom Cost's name across to the, to the Senate. And then I got a call from, from, from Mike Monroney out of the Postmaster General's office. And he said, Tom, we've been instructed by the president to call you to let you know that your name was the only name <laughs> sent into the Senate to be a postmaster in the United States. I thought that was pretty good. So when I was talking to Mike, I said, Mike, uh, the president has told me that I'm going to be on a special assignment. He said, we've already gotten the word. I said, where, where, what you're going to be doing? I said, but what I want you to do, I want you to call every other assistant postmaster general and tell them that the guy named Tom Coston is right out from the president of the United States. I don't want to fool around with anybody. He said, Tom, we've already done that. <laughs> and it made a difference. So anyway, I found myself uh, on that, at that assignment. We went, it was a, a, a post, post office in Texarkana, Texas, where the employees would not go along with the edict of making the changes. And if you stood on the steps of the post office and looked down the main street, on the left-hand side was Arkansas, and the right-hand side was Texas. And, and the fire, the, the postmaster had been, had been, uh, been, uh, 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 Call, telephone calls to his house, and also letters that if he went along with doing what the president wanted, that he would, his house would be firebombed and a few other things. So anyway, we, we went down there on a Monday, and uh, the first thing we did was to take the staff, the, the, uh, the uh, people who were the maintenance people, and went around to every, uh, every uh, place where they had a sign, color only or white only, take them off, and throw them in the dumpster. We don't even want them around. Throw those signs. And so what happened was the, uh, it, it got to the point where the uh, white employees were eating outside. They wouldn't eat. In the, and they would uh, go across the street to the gas station to use the bathroom. Uh, so anyway, it came, it came Thursday, Thursday, Thursday morning, and they would not do, they would not, we met with them every day. They wouldn't do a thing. Thursday morning, I said, I didn't tell my two, my two partners what I was going to do. Uh, I, when we got into the meeting, I said to my two partners, I want you to leave the room. They said, what? Leave the room. And so they left the room. And I pulled out of my pocket my card, and I said to the union president, whose card is this? He said, the president of the United States. I said, the telephone number on the back? He said, yes. I said, here's what I'm going to tell you. I'm going to give you 15 minutes. 
And if you don't agree to go along with what this president wants you to do, he, I'm going to call him, and he's going to nationalize the National Guard in Texas and Arkansas, and we're going to take the postal units from each one of them, and they'll be marching in here to take over your jobs, and you people will be out of work and no pensions. I'm going to give you 15 minutes to make up your mind. Walked out. In seven minutes, they were out. We will do what you want. That's how I treat my wife. <laughs> I pull out the card. I don't believe it. <laughs> I'm weak. I'm weak. Um, anyway, I can tell you one quick story about Tom and his business cards. We had a meeting with, I think it was Governor Weld. And this was uh, when we were beginning the Blue Line campaign. And we pulled into the back of the State House, and he takes a card out of his pocket. He says, what are you doing? He flashes the card, said, my reserve space should be here somewhere. <laughs> yeah, the card in 1993 said, Mayor Thomas P. Costa. <laughs> The man knows how to make business cards work for him. The three of us left that, that meeting, and we went out to the airport. We were flying into Love Field because we were meeting with the regional director of the Postal Service on Friday to tell him what happened. And uh, uh, Warren Bloomberg, who was the postmaster of Baltimore, Maryland, wanted to go and get a haircut. And uh, so Mike Barone, who was, a, was the regional, uh, re regional director for Philadelphia, uh, and I got a cup of coffee. And, and, and when Warren came back, he said, she is so I don't like your friend here very much. I said, why? I said, I, I just mentioned to the barber how nice it was that you, you, the president was coming down in a couple of weeks. And the guy said, if he comes down, that son of a bitch is going to get shot. I said, oh, is that so? I said, listen, well, what we'll do uh, I'm not going to open my mouth because I have too much of a Boston accent. What I want you to do, every place we go, you people talk to, to people. And what we'll do, we'll take down their names and so forth. So what we did, we took down the name of the barber and his number. And so taking the cab, taking the cab to the, uh, well, we, we, we went, got the flight, and we get into Love Field, we got a cab, and when go, we're going into the, uh, to the, uh, the hotel, they asked the talked to the, to, to the driver how nice it was the president was coming. And he used the very same expression, very same expression. That night, we got five other people tell us that if the president came to Dallas, Texas, something was going to happen to him. The next morning, we go to the regional director's office of the Postal Service, and I said, what the hell is happening down here? And he said, let me show you. He opened his top drawer and pulled out two newspapers with full-page ads inciting somebody to take the president's life. I took those newspapers with the information I had, flew home. The first thing I did was to call uh, uh, Bill Hardigan. Bill Hardigan came from Revere, Mass, worked for American Airlines. And uh, when I was mayor, he was on the, city, city, uh, on the school committee in Revere. And we were very close. But during the campaign, he ran all of, uh, all, all of Jack, uh, Jack Kennedy's uh, uh, plane trips. So, and he became assistant postmaster general for, for, for transportation. So I, so I called Bill, told Bill what I had. Bill said, Tommy he said, fly down Monday morning. And he said, tell me when you're coming in. I'll pick you up. We'll go right to the White House. So that's what we did. I got there about quarter past 11. We got to the White House about 11.30. Uh, the president wasn't there. It was 11, the 11th of November. The president was at the, was at the tomb of the unknown soldier, placing a wreath. So we went and saw Kenny O'Donnell, and he said, the president will be coming back because he's going to have dinner or lunch with the soldiers that take care of the tomb of the unknown soldier. He, I, I, I gave him what I had. I said, Ken, he can't go to Dallas, Texas. He said, Tom, here's what we're going to do. 
For the first time, we're going to use the clear plastic bulletproof top down there. And we're going to bring, for the first time on a trip, Jackie's going to come to take some of the play away from the president. I said, well, if you think you, that's going to do it, I'll be fine. I, I won't have to talk to the president. Oh, he said, everything's going to be fine. I went home, back to, back to Lynn. I went, I went for lunch on the 23rd. Got home about 1 o'clock, had a sandwich. My wife was in the other room watching a television program. I heard three words. Dallas, Kenneth, Shaw. Now, the newspaper a few weeks ago said I cried. I didn't cry. I wept. I wept. He was our president, but he was my personal friend. My person, I let him down. I didn't take the card out of my pocket and call him. We had some of the days since that event that sometime during the day I hit three words of Dallas, Kennedy, and Shaw. Open it up for questions. Does anybody have a question for Mayor Costin? Drew. Uh, well, uh, Jack, Jack, uh, uh, Jack only visited visited once. Uh, well, Ted, Ted came uh, to my house in the Han uh, quite a few times. He used to fly in when my wife was sick with cancer. He would, he, they wouldn't even, he'd just call me before they'd be flying in. They'd fly out to Egg Rock, look at the flagpole, and fly right in and land. And they'd spend about an hour, an hour and a half with my wife. Uh, and, because uh, she was on his, my wife was on his finance committee. And, uh, and every, every time it happened, I'd get a call from the chief of police and he'd say, I want you to call me so I can get, have all the protection around there. And I, I, I told, Jack, I told uh, uh, Ted Kennedy that. He said, tell him we don't need protection. <laughs> so we know it never happened. <laughs> he, just, he just came in. Mayor, yeah. uh, what do you think would have happened had Jack Kennedy lived in the Vietnam situation? Well, you know, Joe, you know, I'm glad you asked me that question because when, when, when I was meeting with him a couple of times, when he came in and he needed, <laughs> be eating my, my chicken salad sandwich and drinking my chocolate frap. I, I asked him one day, I asked him about that, and, and he said, you know, Tom, he said, I don't trust the military. And I said, why don't you trust them? He said, when I was lost, they didn't follow military procedure. They told us with, with the PT boats, if your boat is lost and not returned, we will send out two boats. And the two boats, one would be to search for survivors, the other one would be to search any wreckage of a PT boat. They didn't want the Japanese to get their hands on PT boats. And they never sent out a boat. And he told me, he said, I don't, I don't trust them. And, this, and, 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 the, and the other thing is this. During the Bay of Pigs, the, that was run by two members of the CIA, they called the White House and talked to the president and said, we need you to bomb Havana. And the president said, I am not going to bomb women and children. And I don't think Jack Kennedy would allow the bombing that went on and the napalm that went down on people. It never would have happened. I don't think we would have seen, we would have seen the results of uh, uh, Vietnam. Uh, I'm wondering, I, I won't say if, but I'll say when the blue line is brought up to Lynn. May we, may we name the station after you? All I want is to toot the whistle coming into the station. All right. 
But in all seriousness, though, I'm, I'm wondering, did you ever escalate the issue of public transit in Massachusetts, or even specifically Lynn? Did you ever escalate that up to the White House and discuss it with the Kennedys? Uh, no, no, because that wasn't one, really, that wasn't one of the issues, uh, I mean, in that time. If it had been an issue, uh, if he had been in there, I definitely would be knocking on the door. Yeah. I think, you know, the problem with public transportation, what we have to do, we have to start working with, uh, with people, wealthy people, who want to get and uh, work with uh, uh, them to come in and partner with, uh, with the municipalities. And, and if we did that with the MBTA, we could have the best system in the world. Let them come in and uh, let that be part of uh, private and, and public. I think that's what we have to do. They're doing it down in Texas, and I don't care for Texas. <laughs> I'm Brian Costin. I'm a first cousin once removed from Tom. Uh, I wasn't going to get off the Kennedy theme, but since we talked about the blue line, just curious, Elliot Richardson lived in Nahant, correct? Well, did you he, 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 members of his family lived there. Oh, I see. Yeah. You, did you ever have an opportunity to talk to him at all? Uh, no, I never, I never oh, tried. Okay. I, I, was, I, I tried. His, 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 his brother and wife lived just two houses down from us. Yeah, I knew the Richardsons yeah. lived. I, I didn't know yeah. if he was there or not. No, and no. I was just curious right. if you talked to him during the Nixon era. No. And apparently you didn't because no. he didn't live there. No. Okay, Tom, good to see you. Tom, to your right. I don't think you can compare compare it at all. I I, I don't think we. Uh, uh, what, what I'm what I'm concerned about is, is that is that first of all, people don't know their history. The problem is people don't know their history, and people don't know how our government was formed and, and what the government really means. And and I'm afraid I, uh, that, that that's what the the problem is today. We have, we, we, under the Constitution, under the, under, under the Declaration of Independence and the Bill of Rights, we have it set out under the three, three systems, under the judicial, under the legislative, and, and, and so forth. We have three systems, and, and no one person can run the United States. It was never set up that way by the founders. You have to, you have to compromise. You have to step back. You have to work with the other, other branch of government. And, and, and some people, I'm not going to mention names, feel so <laughs> that they can make all the decisions, and they can't. You do that, then you have a dictatorship. And so what has to happen, we have to get people to start thinking. The problem in Washington, they're not listening to each other. They're talking, but they're not listening, and they're not trying to make the proper compromises. And that's what we need. Our government was built on compromise. If they knew their history, they would have realized it. If it, had, if it hadn't been for John Adams stepping back and not taking a, a forward position in any of the things that they wanted to take and, and selecting George Washington to be the commander in chief of, of our forces and, and, and letting, and letting a Virginian, Tommy, Tom Wilkerson, I'm going to say Tommy, Tom Wilkerson, uh, Jefferson uh, write the Declaration of Independence, we probably wouldn't have a country today. But it was compromised then. It's been compromised ever since. And that's what we're going to do. We've got to listen to one another and start working together on common goals. And we're not doing it. <clears throat> Hi, Mary Costin. Thanks again for that uh, fascinating speech. Uh, my question for you is, uh, as a good friend of the president, had he had lived, he would have been a very young man after his presidency. What do you think President Kennedy would have done after the presidency? I think he probably would have come back and been president of Harvard. <laughs> that was, that was his, that was his uh, schooling, and I think that that's what he would have done. If there are no other questions. I want to thank each and every one of you for sitting here listening to an 89-year-old man. <laughs> I, I really Before I finish this evening, I would like to tell you one final story. In November of 1964, uh, I went down to uh, Washington. And I went there because the Postal Service was issuing stamps for John F. Kennedy's uh, assassination. 
And uh, the Postmaster General gave me a beautiful plaque. And that afternoon, late, I went out to the grave site and paid my respects to Jack for another time. And then I went to the airport, National Airport, took my plane to Boston. And as the plane was flying out of National, we were heading northwest. And as I looked out the window to my left, I saw the flickering flame on John Kennedy's grave. I looked across the aisle, out the other windows, and it lined up, the flame of his, on his grave lined up with the uh, Washington Monument and the Capitol. And right then and there, I took a pad of paper, and I wrote this following poem. It was finished as the plane touched down at Logan. And these are my thoughts from that day. One year has passed since that date when death arrived and said, I can't wait. One year has passed since he did die and still his people ask, oh, why? One year has passed since his small children so straight to stand as the case on carried their father across the land. One year has passed since she did light that flame, a flame that signifies a nation's shame. One year has passed the time, how short it seems. Am I involved in this, my nation's shame? Am I involved, am I to share this flame? Did I in this heinous part, crime take part? The answer can only be found in each heart. This dear friend, this hero, this president, was our country's most important resident, who was not afraid to act in the time of strife, even though what he did might mean his life. He spoke out against those who spewed forth hate and tried to pass those laws before it was too late. It was during this time he went to Dallas, a city where some hearts were filled with malice. It was here that he met up with death. It was here that he did taste his last breath. Am I involved in this, my nation's shame? If I am involved, am I to share this flame? If I search and find any hate or malice in my heart, then I too in this crime share a part. Let us ask forgiveness from the Lord above and petition him to fill our hearts with love so that in the future, no small children will have to stand as a case and carries the father across the land. Good night. <laughs>